Okay, excellent. So, on the first section, we had this question. Uh, someone asked me the question, what is the great divide? And one thing I want to also emphasize is that it's a, a lot of times it's a good idea, especially if you printed out the review sheets and taken notes on them, to have put the review sheet on your desk on one side and the PowerPoints on the other side, especially if you've written notes on them, and go through and answer the questions that way. Because usually I kept them in order of the PowerPoints. And a lot of times each question is directly connected to a PowerPoint. So here's this question, what is the great divide? There's a PowerPoint with the title, The Great Divide. Right? And The Great Divide was my attempt to talk about how in these pre-modern societies, how you had this division, and there it's helpfully labeled that you had this great divide, you had this division between elites on the top and commoners on the bottom. And how there was this cultural divide between them. Right? They're separated by culture. And this is something that these societies are always trying to kind of overcome because how do you govern a society, how do you keep it together when you have this very different culture between the elites and the commoners? And that's one reason we, I've been talking a lot about religion in the beginning because a lot of times that's how you had this, you try to overcome this division. So that's basically that. It's a cultural divide between the elites and the commoners that's common throughout all basically the civilizations we have been studying. So that was a fairly simple one. Any questions on that? Now the question is, how are the Japanese and Chinese emperors different? Too many desks up here. Okay, so I'm writing on the board. I'm saying this for people listening on the review sheet. So China, first of all, who rules China? Emperor, emperor right, so he's an emperor. So that's something that they have the same. How is the emperor chosen? Who ch chooses the emperor? Heaven, right, mandate of heaven. Remember, the, the heaven cares about us. Heaven chooses the most wise, good person to rule. So China is ruled by, by that person. So that's why I have this idea of the mandate of heaven. Can you lose the mandate of heaven? Yes. Yeah, you can eventually stop being emperor. If you do a really, really bad job, you can get overthrown because you're doing such a bad job, right? Heaven will send you comets and, and other things to warn you that you're doing a bad job. But if you keep doing a bad job, heaven will kick you out and a new family will come into power. So you can lose this. That's why there's a lot of Chinese dynasties. Right, so you're chosen by the mandate of heaven. Japan, who who theoretically rules Japan? Uh, who's, uh, right, right. He rules on behalf of the emperor, right. Yeah, remember, and no, you raise an interesting point. In China, we say that the emperor has a political and a religious role. Right, in, emperor, in China, the emperor is like a pope and a king all together. He has a religious and a political role. In Japan, it's a little different. The emperor has a religious role, and this guy called the shogun, I believe that's on the terms list. Oh, it is? Okay, thank you. That's on the terms list as well, so you want to make sure you know that. The shogun has the political role. Remember, the shogun's like this military dictator who rules on behalf of the emperor. So it's split. In Japan, you have two guys doing the job that you have only one guy doing in China. That's kind of an odd situation, right? Why would you have this split? It has to do with who the emperor is in Japan, right? Why is the emperor of Japan the emperor of Japan? Right, he's a descendant of Amaterasu, the sun goddess, which is another term. That's why you can't overthrow, that's why you can't change the dynasty, right? I can claim to be the most virtuous person, I'm not, but I can make that claim. I can't claim to be the descendant of the sun goddess. Everyone knows I'm not the descendant of the sun goddess. So because of this, they have to keep the emperor around. So the emperor in Japan is cho it has this position because he's descended from the sun goddess. In China, it's because of this mandate of heaven. You can lose the mandate of heaven. You can't lose being the descendant of Amaterasu, the sun goddess. You can't lose your parents and your heritage in that way. So any questions about that? Okay, excellent. So, why was the spread of popular culture important in Japan? And this is one of those video questions. Right? We had all those people, that we had this, uh, when the, J the shoguns managed to gain power in the 1600s in Japan, you'll recall that this led to a time of peace and growth and prosperity for Japan, and that led to a further development of popular culture. And why does that matter? Why is popular culture important? It meets the different classes. Yeah, it unites people, right? It unites the different classes. 
Exactly, exactly. It helps you start crossing that great divide. So it started giving Japanese people a sense of not so much you're a samurai, I'm a merchant, but hey, we all are Japanese. Right, so it's encouraging national Japanese identity. Right, it's making us think of ourselves as Japanese people who share this similar Japanese culture. So that's why this is important. It's helping give Japanese people a sense of identity. Okay, we had this other question then. Why didn't China experience a scientific revolution? Okay, just making sure that was still recording. And this again is, a, this one slide isn't uh, labeled as, as helpfully, I suppose, as the other slide, but this is the slide that helps us to answer that. Yes, Charles? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, these are the questions. The questions in bold are questions people ask me about. Oh, okay. So these are people, so that's, that's a good thing you raise up. So questions in bold are ones people ask me about. So I'm gonna answer those first. Okay. If we have time, we'll go back through. But for now, I'm just answering the ones people emailed me. That's why I had the, the bonus exercise, so I knew these are the ones people had the most trouble with. So why did China experience a revolution, scientific revolution? Well, remember that Chinese, first of all, are getting exposed to Westerners. For example, they're getting exposed to this guy, Matteo Ricci, who's this astronomer. Now, the pr problem is they just hired these uh, Western missionaries to do the work for them. It pretty much just stays there. And the, one of the key reasons for that is that China emphasized moral knowledge over technical knowledge. Remember, if you wanted to become a government official, you took the exams, which were based on Confucius. And Confucius had a lot of good things to say, and Confucianism helped China build a society or civilization that lasted for a very long time, and worked very effectively. But it didn't encourage science because it emphasized moral knowledge, not technical knowledge. And we also have to emphasize, and also this technical, what technical knowledge they did have was often a secret. You weren't supposed to share no technical knowledge. Um, so, for example, you couldn't go buy an astronomy textbook. Only the, the, only the emperor was supposed to really understand astronomy. So this is kind of a problem. And also we want to remember China was so successful, was so rich and powerful, they didn't see a need to develop science. Right? You only develop things when you see a need, and China didn't feel the need to develop science. So any questions there? Okay. Let's see. How did the Kangxi Emperor convince Chinese people that Qing Dynasty had the mandate of heaven? This is another one that really focused on a video. Right? We had the, the Kangxi Emperor, we, we had a video where the Kangxi Emperor went and did something. That's one reason I like to show the videos. So hopefully it'll give you kind of an image. What did the, and what did that video show the Kangxi Emperor doing? He paid respect to um, Confucius. Exactly, thank you, Josh. Yes, he paid respect to Confucius. Right? Remember, the, the emperor of China, the most, arguably the most powerful man in the world, got down on his knees and bowed to Confucius. And so Chinese people said, aha, he's not a barbarian. He has accepted Chinese civilization. So he's not a barbarian. And if he's not a barbarian, he can have the mandate of heaven. He can have the mandate of heaven. So this is important. He convinces them because he accepts Chinese civilization, Chinese culture. Okay. Number nine, uh, why despite the development of the turtle ship, didn't Korea and other East Asian countries develop more advanced military technology? We talked about in the 1590s, Japan invaded Korea in an attempt to invade China, right? They're invading, they want to invade China through Korea, but the Chinese and the Koreans work together and defeat the Japanese, and that's where the Koreans developed these turtle ships, which were, I think, pretty cool. Um, why did they stop? Yeah, there was no need. Or people only do things that they need to do them. Right? And after this defeat, and after, I mean, there's the, the Qing invade later, but for the most part, for about 200 years in East Asia, they're going to have peace. If you're in a peaceful situation, why would you develop, spend money and resources developing military technology? It's not necessary. In contrast, the Europeans were always fighting each other constantly. So because of that, they were always developing new military technology in order to be able to defeat their enemies. So that's important. Okay, number 10, how would you characterize Tokugawa Japan's relationship with Western countries? Why did Tokugawa Japan take that stance? This is another one I like to go back to the old PowerPoint to talk about. 
And this is the one I think helps answer that question. Remember, the Tokugawa are suppressed Christianity. Right, Japan, they say, we don't want those Christians running around anymore. They're a force for instability. Right? Those Christians are all united together under the Pope. Uh, these are Catholic Christians. They may rebel against us, so we want to get rid of them. Those Christians, the, I'm sorry, the missionaries who came to those people were mostly Portuguese and Spanish. And so the Japanese said, no more Portuguese and Spanish. We don't want the Portuguese and Spanish here because they're going to try and convert people to Catholicism, and those people might rebel. So get rid of the Portuguese and Spanish. However, there was one exception, the Dutch. Now, well, why did they allow the Dutch in? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so sometimes we say that Japan closed the door, but opened the window. They were afraid the Europeans might try and invade them. So they wanted to have the Dutch around to give them news about Europe. They figured if the, if the Europeans are going to invade us, the Dutch will know, and then we'll know what's happening. Miss Scott? Wasn't it also because the Dutch didn't let the missionaries deal with their training? Right, exactly, exactly. Good point, too. The Dutch were not Catholic. They were Calvinist Protestants, and they didn't, weren't really interested in missionary work. So they promised not to convert anyone to Christianity. And they didn't really have much of an option because they all had to live on an island and weren't allowed off the island except twice a year. But good point. So, like I say, they want to keep ahead of the news. They want to know what's going on. So that's all for East Asia for now. If we have time, we'll come back. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not all. So we had this question. Some people asked about the term. So, for example, remember, Imjin is a war. That's the war, name of the war where Japan invaded China and Korea. That will, And Shogun is the title of the of the military dictator who rules Japan, those will not. Those could be on the matching section. They will not be on the triad because they're not people's names. The um, but so the terms. Someone asked this question about Zheng He. Or Zheng He is that Chinese explorer. And I don't. Okay, here we are. I put this up. They asked about why he stopped. Right, China goes out and is spreading, is exploring. Why did he stop? Well. Right, he does eventually die, but he would, things, or I'm sorry, that's a good point, I shouldn't say why did Zheng He stop, why did China stop? They conquered what they needed, what they wanted Improved. to, there was everyone going forward with it. Mm -hmm. Right, yes, it's Emily? Yeah. Okay, yeah, excellent, excellent, right. They accomplished what they were trying to do, remember, they were trying to obtain tribute. They wanted to get, um, they brought in all these people from outside the country to come in, uh, Indians, Africans, and they came in and they kowtowed to the emperor, they bowed to the emperor and said how great the emperor was. And other Chinese people said, wow, we have a really great emperor. He must really have the mandate of heaven. And once that was done, why would you need to do it anymore? So that was one reason. Remember, also they were focused on the north. They were afraid that people from the north, Mongols or the Manchus, were going to come in and invade them. So they focused on building up the Great Wall. can't spend money on expeditions when you're spending money to defend yourself. And remember, when the Ming Dynasty is overthrown, it's those people from the north who are actually going to do it. So that the Chinese were, were uh, correct here in their concern. There was also fear, just like the Japanese had, that bringing in Westerners and Western ideas and, and so forth, or, or bringing in foreign ideas, could be, lead to instability. And also, remember, the Confucians don't really like trade. Chinese felt like they had everything they needed. Why would we need this? Now, I want to point out, not necessarily this question, but this type of question. When I give you a list, this is a perfect type of 